Picture this, you're standing in the middle of an Arctic blizzard. The wind howls like a freight train. The air slices through your coat like a knife. And the thermometer has fallen so low, it might as well be broken minus 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Out here, your breath freezes before it even leaves your lips. Now imagine, there's not a single tree for miles. No campfire, no pile of logs, nothing to throw on the flames. Just endless ice and snow. Most of us would be done for in less than an hour. But the Inuit, they didn't just survive this nightmare. They mastered it. With no firewood, they built homes out of snow that could outsmart the cold, crafted clothing warmer than any modern jacket and kept the dark at bay with nothing but seal oil. How did they do it? That's the mystery we're about to unravel step by step, the old ways that kept life burning in the frozen north. Here's the paradox. The Arctic is a land of raging blizzards, where the wind tears across the ice like a war drum, and yet not a single tree stands on the horizon. No wood for a fire, no logs for shelter, nothing that most of us would consider essential. And still, the Inuit endured it all. Their survival wasn't luck. It was a system forged from science, ingenuity, and cultural wisdom passed down like heirlooms. They carved homes from snow that held steady warmth, not by magic, but by physics. Thick blocks arched like the stone vault of a medieval fortress. They wore caribou hides layered like armor, each hollow hair a natural insulator. They fueled their bodies with seal blubber, dense with calories richer than any ration pack a soldier carried into campaign. And when darkness fell, their hearth was the kulik, a lamp of stone and seal oil steady as the fire in a castle keep. This wasn't chance, this was design. Proof that with the right knowledge, a man can make life possible, even where nature seems determined to end it. Now let's start with the most iconic tool of Arctic survival, the igloo. Imagine a house made entirely of snow, yet warmer inside by 40 to 60 degrees, Fahrenheit compared to the raging storm outside. That's not a tall tale, it's physics, engineering, and generations of refinement. The Inuit didn't just stack snow like children piling bricks. They cut compact blocks, each weighing 50 to 60 pounds, and set them in a rising spiral. The angle had to be just right too shallow, and the dome collapsed outward too steep, and it caved in. It's geometry homework, but graded in frostbite, not letter grades. The result was a self-supporting arch as strong in its way as the stone vaults of a medieval cathedral. The design went beyond shape. The entrance tunnel sat lower than the main chamber, a deliberate cold sink. Cold air pooled at the bottom while the raised sleeping platform about two feet above placed the family in the warmest pocket of air. Anyone who spent a night in a snow shelter knows how unforgiving dampness and cold air at ground level can be. The Inuit engineered their way around it. Inside body heat and the steady flame of a Kulik lamp glazed the inner walls. That thin ice shell hardened the structure and sealed cracks turning loose snow into a fortress against the wind. A properly built igloo, 10 to 12 feet in diameter, could shelter four to six people comfortably and be built in under two hours by skilled hands. This wasn't luck. It was applied science airflow insulation structure turned into a living shelter, a lesson every bushcrafter and survivalist can take to heart. Even the humblest material shaped with knowledge can become a fortress. When there is no firewood, your very clothing becomes your fireplace. For the Inuit survival meant turning animal hides into a complete heating system more efficient than many modern fabrics we rely on today. The heart of that system was the double-layer caribou parka. Each hair of caribou fur is hollow, like a tiny straw filled with air, and that trapped air is one of the best insulators in nature. In fact, square inch for square inch caribou fur holds about five times more warmth than wool. The Inuit wore two layers the inner parka, with the fur facing inward to hold body heat close, and the outer layer with the fur facing outward to break the wind. Think of it as layered armor soft, yes, but as protective as a knight's gambeson beneath steel. 
It created a microclimate so effective that hunters sometimes risked overheating at minus 40 degrees, overheating at 40 below only in Inuit fashion. The boots or comics were crafted from seal skin. Seal hide stays flexible even in brutal cold, and when combined with dried grass or fur liners, it wicked away sweat, critical because moisture is the enemy of warmth. Mittens, too, were oversized and lined with fur, letting the fingers huddle together like soldiers, sharing body heat in a trench. Every seam overlapped, every cuff extended, leaving no gaps for the cold to creep in. The design was deliberate, a full-body fortress of fur. Here's the takeaway for bushcrafters and preppers. Warmth doesn't just come from fire. It can be carried with you if you understand layering airflow and insulation. The Inuit mastered that truth centuries ago. Forget carbs here, fat is life. In the Arctic, where the cold devours energy like a furnace, the Inuit relied on a diet that would terrify modern nutritionists, but kept them alive and strong. A man in these conditions could burn six to 10,000 calories in a single day, three to five times the daily need of a farmer in temperate lands. That fuel came not from bread or grain, but from fat, seal blubber, whalefish oils, and caribou. A single pound of seal blubber carries roughly 4,500 calories, enough to run a family for a day in warmer climates, but only enough to sustain one hunter through the Arctic night. Raw meat played its part, too. Cooking fires were impractical inside igloos, and raw organ meats carried vital nutrients, especially vitamin C. One portion of raw seal liver contains more vitamin C than six oranges, an irony lost on the early European explorers who scorned the practice and many paid with scurvy for ignoring Inuit wisdom. Think of blubber as the medieval knight's feast, except stripped to essentials dense fuel for body and mind, each bite a log thrown into the body's furnace. Without it, no clothing, no igloo, no clever trick would keep you warm. The lesson for bushcrafters and preppers is plain food is heat. You must match intake to output or the cold will claim you. So, yes, it's a diet that would shock a dietitian, but in the Arctic, it worked flawlessly. Fat was an indulgence. It was survival. Sitting still is the fastest way to freeze. The Inuit knew this truth as surely as a soldier on winter campaign or a woodsman in a snowbound forest. In the Arctic, where the air itself can kill movement, is heat. The human body generates warmth through thermogenesis muscle activity, producing energy that radiates as heat. Even the smallest action counts. Hunters would flex their fingers inside mittens, shift weight from one foot to the other, roll shoulders or bend knees. These micro-movements kept blood flowing, especially to hands and feet, where frostbite strikes first. Modern studies show that standing still in minus 30 degrees can drop core temperature by 3 degrees Fahrenheit in half an hour enough to push you toward hypothermia, but constant subtle motion can raise extremity temperature by nearly 10 degrees, often the difference between saving and losing a finger. The Inuit built this principle into daily life. Repairs on tools tending the igloo or sewing clothing were not idle chores. They were deliberate ways to keep bodies in motion. Even sleep reflected this wisdom. The slightly firm caribou hide bedding encouraged shifting positions each turn, sparking a bit of warmth. Anyone who spent a night in a snow shelter knows how quickly stillness turns to chill. The Inuit had already solved that problem centuries ago. The lesson is clear for every bushcrafter and prepper. Never let the cold lull you into stillness. Keep moving, even if only a little. A fortress of fur and snow will keep the wind out, but your own muscles must keep the fire alive within. No firewood. No problem. The Inuit drew heat and light from the ocean itself. Their tool was the kulik, the traditional seal oil lamp carved most often from soapstone. It was not decoration. It was survival, every bit as vital to them as the hearth fire in a medieval stone keep. 
The design was elegant in its simplicity. The crescent-shaped bowl, sometimes two feet across, was filled with rendered seal oil fuel that burned hot and clean. Along the rim, wicks of dried moss or arctic cotton grass were carefully trimmed and tended. The flame could be lengthened for more heat or shortened to conserve oil. In skilled hands, a kulik could maintain room temperature within 2 to 3 degrees Fahrenheit of target and accuracy. Few modern camp stoves can claim. Soapstone wasn't chosen by chance. It absorbs heat and releases it slowly, acting as a thermal battery. Placed at the heart of an igloo, the kulik warmed the air. Dried clothing hung nearby and provided a steady light during the long polar night. One well-tended lamp could raise the inside temperature of a snow shelter by 30 to 40 degrees Fahrenheit, often the thin line between life and death. Anyone who has ever shivered by a weak campfire knows how precious reliable heat is. The Inuit didn't just have heat, they had control. The Kulik was thermostat stove dryer and lantern all in one. For bushcrafters and preppers, the lesson is timeless. Ingenuity can turn the humblest resources into a complete survival system. Your scented candle could never. Even sleep was engineered for survival. The Inuit knew that a night's rest in the Arctic was not about comfort. It was about staying alive until morning. Inside the igloo, sleeping platforms were raised roughly two feet above the entrance. That design wasn't accidental. Cold air sinks warm air rises. By elevating the bed, they placed themselves directly in the warmest layer of the room, while the cold pooled harmlessly below in the tunnel. Tests today show that this simple change can create a 15-degree difference between floor level and sleeping height. In an environment where every degree matters, that could mean the difference between waking up stiff or not waking up at all. The bedding itself was caribou hide layered with the fur angled upward on the bottom and downward on the top. Thousands of hollow hairs trapped air in overlapping chambers, creating insulation with an R value higher than most modern sleeping bags up to 40 in a well-prepared bed. Anyone who's ever tried to sleep on snow knows how quickly it robs body heat. The Inuit had solved that centuries ago. But survival wasn't only physical. Families often slept close together, pooling body heat, just as soldiers once huddled in medieval campaign tents. Mental toughness mattered just as much. They relied on humor patience and shared responsibility to endure the long darkness. Jokes and stories became a kind of psychological insulation as vital as fur and stone. Here's the lesson. Rest is not idleness. In true survival, even the way you lie down at night must be deliberate. The Inuit mastered that art turning sleep into one more tool in their arsenal against the cold. So let's gather the lessons. The Inuit forged not one trick, but a complete system of survival. First, the igloo snow transformed into shelter 40 to 60 degrees warmer inside, then the blizzard outside a fortress shaped by physics as precise as stone masonry in a medieval vault. Second, the clothing double-layered caribou fur and sealskin boots turning the body itself into a furnace. Each hollow hair worked like a soldier in formation, locking in warmth and breaking the wind's assault. Third, the diet fat is fuel. Six to 10,000 calories a day, drawn from blubber and raw meat food that kept blood vessels open in the cold and provided vitamin C in amounts enough to fend off scurvy. A diet that would rattle a nutritionist but sustain life in the world's harshest climate. Fourth movement, never sitting still. Fingers flexing, shoulders rolling tools repaired every task, doubling as exercise. A strategy as practical as any field manual motion is fire. And finally, the lamp, the kulik. Soapstone moss, wick, and seal oil combined into a hearth, a stove, and a lantern. It was their hearth fire as vital as the fireplace in a castle keep. The Inuit didn't just survive without firewood. They thrived using science, ingenuity, and deep cultural wisdom. That wisdom deserves respect. For bushcrafters, preppers, or anyone who studies survival, the message is clear. Learn from those who mastered the cold. 
adapt their knowledge, marvel at their ingenuity. Because in the end, survival is not about what you lack, it's about what you know.